All right. So we're going to talk about detailed modeling with 2D flow areas. And the main objective of this lecture is that to show examples of detailed 2D models that were developed in RAS, discuss how they were developed, you know, like cell size and equations and time steps and all that kind of stuff. And, um, and then talk about them a little bit, OK? And we're going to do that through examples. And I've got um, six examples. And these are the examples here listed. And most of these examples, well, all of these examples actually require detailed modeling and the use of the full shallow water equations. And we'll talk about why, as we go through here, that the diffusion wave equations just wouldn't work for these. OK. So let's first talk about the equations themselves. So uh, you had this already, but just a reminder that whether you're using diffusion wave or full St. Bernard shallow water equations, um, there's the continuity equation. Mass conservation is one of the equations. But then the second equation is a momentum equation. And with the full momentum equation, shallow water equations, we have gravity, friction, hydrostatic pressure forces, acceleration, two acceleration terms, though, local, meaning change of velocity with respect to time at any given phase, and convective, meaning the change in velocity with respect to distance, OK, from upstream down to that phase. And then you can actually turn on eddy viscosity and turbulence modeling and wind forces and Coriolis effects. But with diffusion wave, we still have mass conservation, but we only have gravity and friction and hydrostatic pressure. So none of these optional parameters and no acceleration terms, none. And the loss of those acceleration terms are huge for certain problems. And it's good to understand, well, what problems is the, are those acceleration terms really important for? What do I need them? And, and understanding that difference. So the first thing we're going to look at is an instantaneous dam break. So I have uh, a dam, and we're going to. This is going to be the breach area in the middle. And over the course of a single time step, it's going to go from completely blocked to completely unblocked in one time step. And we're going to call that an instantaneous dam break. So this model was run with the full St. Bernard equations. The grid size is two meters by two meters throughout the model. Um, we used a variable time step. At first, when it first breaches, we're using half a second, OK? And then as it settles down and the water starts to get reduced, it starts increasing the time step, which is a good thing to do in a lot of dam breaks. A variable time step is probably a good approach because when the dam breaches, you want small time steps to get that accurate. But once it's done breaching and the water's propagating downstream and kind of diffusing naturally, you can start to get away with larger time steps. The starting pool is eight meters deep. OK, so this is a metric data set. The downstream is dry. OK, and we got this building in here. OK, so this water is going to come out of here and it's going to hit this building. And it's going to be interesting to see what happens for the water hitting this building and having to go around it. OK, I also um, dropped what's called theta. And you should have had a little bit of discussion of theta. Theta of one is the most conservative, uh, meaning it gives you the most stable answer, but it doesn't necessarily give you as accurate an answer uh, for some cases, um, especially rapidly rising and falling water surfaces. Uh, lower thetas as you go towards 0.6 is going to give you more accurate answers, but it, it could increase the instability. OK, so it's kind of a, um, a give and take type of thing. I did have eddy viscosity turned on for this one, and uh, I put in DL and DT of 0.35. And this whole thing is 75 meters wide, and it ends up being 2,000 meters long. You're not seeing all of it. It goes downstream further. The slope of this is zero. It's flat. But we're starting with eight meters deep of water. Simulation time is only 30 minutes. And it took about 37 seconds for RAS to run it. So here we're going to see um, a plot just with depth of water animated. So let's watch that first. So here we go. And you can see by the darkness where it gets deep. So you notice it's shallow in here, and it gets deep in front of the, the building. Let's back that up and do that again. So look at the colors. So it's going to hit the building, and it's getting deep. So it's going through a hydraulic jump right through here. OK. Now let's look at that in terms of uh, water surface. So now I'm plotting water surface. So the purple is 8 meters deep, and the very lightest green is like 0 depth. OK. And so what we're going to see is that when this water hits this building, it's coming out of here and it goes super critical. It passes through critical depth somewhere up near the breach. It goes super critical, but it hits the building and it runs up on, onto the building and causes a disturbance in a backwater. 
and then there's going to be a hydraulic jump right in front of it. It's going to go from a shallow depth like one meter up to a deep depth like 2.5 to 3 meters right in front of the building. So let's look at that. And on the bottom, I got the plot of a profile plot of the same thing, so you can watch them both together. So look at the wave run up on the building here, and now that disturbance that building is causing a propagation upstream. This is something that wouldn't even show up with diffusion wave. You would get no wave run up because you have to have the acceleration terms. I'm going to back that up and play it again. You have to have the acceleration terms to get this water to actually run up alongside the building due to the momentum of the velocity. Without that, it would it would just hit the building and it would it would go up, but it would go up horizontal just from filling behind it with the diffusion wave equations. It can't do that. Um, the other thing um, I want you to note is the bouncing off the sides of the walls. So let's back up one more time. Watch the water surface this time bounce off the sides of the walls and what happens on the side walls in addition to the building. So look at those disturbances coming in. Okay. So there's a whole lot of going on here. There's bouncing around of water, both horizontally, but laterally. Okay. Because of the walls. Okay. And this kind of stuff, you're only going to get an accurate answer if you have the shallow water equations, the full equations with the acceleration terms in there. Okay. Now here's a plot of just the um, velocity. So we can see when this is at an instant in time, you know, after the breach has occurred, obviously, but we can, what we're seeing here is that we go from very low velocity to super high velocity here, but because of the hydraulic jump, it goes back to low velocity. So through critical depth, accelerating, shallow depth, really high velocity, hydraulic jump, slow velocity. We see the separation around the building and these eddies forming behind it. Again, with diffusion wave, you wouldn't see any of this recirculation zone. You wouldn't see this recirculation zone either, or this one, because it can't do that without those acceleration terms in the equations. So this is kind of thing, if you were looking to try to get an accurate answer near this breach, and what would happen near a breach on a building, you have to use the full shallow water equations. You can't use diffusion wave for that at all. OK, next example, flow around a bend. So water is going to start in the upper right, and we're going to we're going to go from a very low flow to a high flow really fast, and send that around a bend, okay, and then hold it constant flow. Um, we we're going to use full sample knot again. Grid sizes are four feet by four feet. We're going to use a half a second time step. Run it for four hours to get it to settle down to an answer, okay. Um, again, theta down to 0.8 in this case. Eddy viscosity turned on in this case. Um, the channel is about 100 feet wide. Uh, slope is one foot per mile longitudinally along the direction of flow. The water depth ends up being around five feet and the flow rate is 3,000 CFS. Now this is actually an example data set out of a hydraulics book. It, from, it's from Chow's Open Channel Hydraulics book. Um, and they d actually did this um, in a field study, okay? Um, and they actually measured a 1.5 foot elevation change from A to B. So they're going to get super elevation around the bend because it's a really sharp bend and a high flow rate. And the water surface at A was 1.5 feet lower than the water surface at B. In RAS, when I ran the same data set, I ended up getting 1.44 feet. So not quite as much change as the, the field value, but pretty close. Now, this is obviously a three-dimensional flow problem. We're modeling it in 2D. So we're missing something that's happening here with kind of like circular kind of velocities that occur. Once this velocity comes in, there's some, some circular velocities that occur. And then because of those circular velocities, there's actually more disturbance in the flow field. And the 2D model isn't picking up the entire disturbance, which is why I probably under predicted the super elevation a little bit. But let's go ahead and animate this and so you can see what it looks like in terms of, of velocity. And this is the cross section A to B on the left. So you can see that on the far left is the A side and on the, on the right of the cross section plot is the B side. And as the, we're going up in flow rate till we get to that constant 3,000 CFS, you can see the change in water surface from inside to outside. And now we're at the, you know, the 3,000 CFS holding constant. So about 1.45 feet from RAS, the, the observed was 1.5 feet, but it's a 2D prediction of a 
pretty highly three-dimensional flow process, but still does reasonably well. So if I were designing this bin, I might be able to use RAS as a preliminary design tool to get rough answers. And then for a final, you know, if I narrowed it down to one or two or three designs, I might then go to a 3D model and or a physical model or both to get a final design. Okay, here's an example of a tidal situation. So we're on the Gulf Coast and we're in Louisiana and we're right next to the Mississippi River. And there was a study done about siphoning off water off the Mississippi to put sediment into this area to re-nourish and replenish the sediment that was lost from the natural meandering that should have been occurring on the Mississippi down at this point. And um, we used RAS just to look at this kind of hydraulically. Um, we didn't use RAS at the time. This was quite a while ago we did this study, um, or somebody did this study, I didn't do it, but, um, but they were just looking at the hydraulics, okay? And so for the ocean, there's a tidal boundary condition. You use a stage versus time hydrograph for the tidal boundary. And then for the diversion inflow, it, it, they, it was off at first, but then they opened up the gates and it goes up to 80,000 CFS really quickly, okay? So we had a mesh that we developed and we are able to use fairly large grid cells in this case because of the RAS's ability to, you know, to do the subgrid technology for the cells and the faces. And we're also able to, this is quite a large area actually, and use a two minute time step in theta 0.8. And we ran seven months of simulation in this case. And it took a little over an hour and seven minutes to run on my, my PC. So here I'm gonna plot in animation, a water surface. And the water surface is really light blue is zero. And then dark blue is like one foot. And then green's one five, yellow's two, orange is 2.5 and red is, is three um, feet in elevation. So here we are, come, you can see the tide kind of coming in and, and pushing in. Okay, so the, light, the lighter blue is the tide um, going out and then the darker blue is the tide coming in. Okay, there's the green, there's the tide coming in. There's the tide kind of going out, actually. There's the tide coming in. And then notice up here, we've started to get this red because we're bringing in the flow of the 80,000 CFS, okay? So this kind of wave propagation from a tide, um, I think from the very first lecture, I showed you something on the Columbia River similar to this, and it's, it's just that the diffusion wave without the acceleration terms can't get the wave propagation correct. So it's not gonna actually predict the right push of water surface up into here due to the tide and how far it goes and the right elevation and the right velocities. So anything you do at tides, you got to use full shallow water equations. Okay, you can't use diffusion wave. It's just not the right approach. We're going to look at what I call detail bridge modeling. So yesterday we, we learned about how to put a bridge in RAS using kind of a pseudo 1D approach, still 2D flow, but really using kind of 1D hydraulic equations. Here we're not going to use any um, empirical bridge equations or like energy based or momentum or pressure and wear flow. We're just gonna model this whole thing as 2D open channel flow. And I put the piers into the terrain, okay? This was done before we had the channel modification capabilities. So actually Cam had to help me and we did this over in ArcGIS actually. Um, so we're, we're gonna, the piers are four foot by four foot piers and we're actually using in the pier area, two foot cells through the bridge opening. So you can see. Now the key here is, is as long as you have faces crossing through the piers, then those faces are blocked out, okay? And water will have to go around these piers. So as long as you have faces going through the piers, which we do, okay, then those piers are being captured. It's preferable that if you had a face right at the upstream end, which I, I did on purpose, I aligned the grid such as this face would go right to the upstream side. Water's going from left to right in this case. Now, when I ran that, this is just a picture of the water surface and with um, contours, for equal water service turned on. And this purple is higher water service and this green is lighter. So it's just showing the kind of traditional water is gonna contract to get through the opening and change. Okay, now non-traditional though, this, this bridge happens to go into a steep canyon. Okay, it doesn't really expand back out like a lot of bridge locations would. Now let's look at the um, velocities. And a couple things I want you to take note of. First of all, there was a, a area of terrain that was really high and I think it's a mistake. I think it was actually a stand of trees that it didn't get taken out of the train model. But I left it in there because it's kind of a, a neat anomaly in the train because water actually has to go around this, this ground here. 
and it's gonna create a disturbance right here, and there's gonna be some eddies that form behind it. But also notice the water has to, it's coming from the lower left and has to turn to go through the bridge opening. And so it's hitting these piers, not straight on, kind of a slight angle. Okay, so there's, um, there's more high velocity on the right-hand side than there is on the left-hand side, which you'll see. And the other thing that's happening is because it's turning so sharply, there's an eddy that forms here. And then there's another disturbance here that it turns and an eddy that forms here. So let's have a look at that. So here's the velocity profile coming through. And look at the details in the velocity and the velocity tracers. That's because we're using really small cells, okay? We've got every, the peers modeled as terrain. We've got small enough cells and faces to pick up all the peers in detail, okay? And we actually see flow separation around the peers, okay, and lower velocities. And we see this eddy forming, these eddies forming behind this dis disturbance here. Let's look at that one more time. Now, this is another situation where even in front of the piers, you see a little bit slowing down in velocity because it's hard to see real close, but there's some yellow there instead of, because there's wave run up in the front of this pier and then it separates around. And look at the very low velocity in between the piers. Okay, you're not gonna capture that kind of stuff with diffusion wave. Again, full, full shallow water equations with the acceleration terms. Without that, we wouldn't see any of this. This one also had turbulence turned on and, and, and which is, helps with maybe getting the right um, recirculation zone as far as the length and velocities and so forth. Here's another example where they had a river system and there was a proposed structure with piers for a railroad station, okay? So there's a railroad track that comes along here and they proposed putting in this structure on piers above the river floodplain to have a railroad station, okay? So the the, the purpose of this model was to look at before and after what's going to happen to the water services for different events if we put this structure in. So RAS was used to model this structure with all these piers. And so there's just, you know, hundreds of piers here. So if we look at this in 3D, we can see kind of in 3D all the piers. Okay. And also notice the benching they did in the floodplain, okay, for the proposed structure, structure and floodplain. Um, so full sample dot equations again, because they wanted to know detailed velocities, not only in the river, but when they impact these piers, okay? Really small cells, two foot by two foot, small time steps, because it turns out the velocities are high through here. So we had to go down to 0.2 second time steps for this one, given the small cell size and the high velocities. Turbulence was turned on um, with uh, very, not really high coefficients, but medium kind of coefficients about half a million cells. And the, the duration was just 12 hours because it was just ramping up to a constant flow rate to see what the, in this case, it was a 100 year event. Um, and that took six hours to run on my machine. Here's a zoom in of the piers. They're quite large piers. These circular piers are, are uh, almost six feet in diameter. These piers are four foot by, I think, 10 or 12, something like that, I forget the exact dimensions. There's different types of piers. So let's look at an animation of this. And I'm gonna do velocity as well as water surface extents. And uh, orange velocities are around, or red velocities are over 12 feet per second in this case. So we got some high velocity zones. Okay, now if we zoom in to some of the interesting area, look at how the flow separates around these piers and the change in velocity, okay? And specifically look in front of like this big, these big piers, you can see like a dead zone. That's because the water's running right up on front of that pier and slowing down the velocity right there in order to go around it. And so you're getting slow velocities behind the piers, recirculation zones, higher velocity between the piers, okay? So if you really need detailed velocities like this is, RAS can do this, but the key is small cells, small time steps, full shallow water equations, possibly turbulence turned on, et cetera. We've got some really high velocities in the channel. This pier is getting some high velocities going around the corner of it. And so that might tell us that, hey, if, if we want to prevent this thing from eroding, we're going to need some big rock around the edge of this pier. These other piers, the velocities are high, but not as high as this one. 
And as you go in further, there's slower, slower velocities. So the piers closer to the river are going to need much more protection from scour. This is just a water surface plot, and I on purpose made the scale really small. It's only going from 33.5 to 35.2. So you can see the huge change in water surface right in front of the piers, where the higher velocities are. Where the lower velocities are, there's not as much wave run up, which makes sense. I think this is the last example, and this is down in New Orleans. And they were designing, this is back when they were designing the 17th Street pump station and gate openings. So the idea here is they have these gates that are opened all the time, generally, until they get a hurricane. When a hurricane comes, they close these gates, and that would prevent any water from coming in to the canal. But then the pump station has to turn on, and this is the pump sump area, and then water will go into these bays and be pumped out to Lake Pontchartrain, which is north of here. Okay. So in this case, what we're going to model is the gate openings being completely open. They're not pressurized. The gates are out of the water. So that's why you can get away with modeling them just as open channel flow. So again, full momentum. Grid size through the gates are just one foot cells. And then we gradually transition to two foot cells and then four foot cells away from the gates. Eddy viscosity turned on with 0.5 coefficients, about 100,000 cells. This particular run is 12,500 CFS, ran it for 20 minutes to settle down, took about 17 minutes to run on my machine. So pump sump, 11 gate openings. Upstream, we have a flow hydrograph boundary condition. This is upstream down here at the bottom. And downstream, we have a stage hydrograph to represent the water surface in Lake Pontchartrain, which was at, at minus one uh, down there. It's, they looked at several different lake levels, so that lots and lots of runs were made with this. Here's a zoom in on the gate configuration. So you're seeing the, the gate openings. These two gates are really deep. These gates are a little more shallow. And then these gray blobs are the, the concrete between the gate openings. Okay. You can also see this is the pump sump area to the right here, and water has to come around it and get to get through these gate openings. RAS was used as kind of like a 2D screening tool to get to just a final couple of designs, but the actual final design was done with a 3D model called Fluent 3D. However, one of the things I wanted to do is I, after they had their 3D modeling results, I said, let's compare a RAS run with a Fluent run for the exact same terrain configuration, exact same flow rate. And so that's what this is. So here we have a water surface map. On the right is the Fluent water surface. On the left is the RAS water surface for the same flow rate, same configuration. OK, the water surface isn't exactly the same, but it's pretty close. And in fact, the water surface at the upstream end, RAS predicted 2.3 up here, and Fluent had 2.32, a little bit higher. Now, this color scale was done with Fluent graphics, and this color scale was done with RAS and RAS Mapper, so it might not be exact one to one. I tried to get the same exact color scale, but it might not be perfect, but it's pretty close. So the change in water surface is similar through here, not exact. Let's look at velocity. So here's a plot. On the RAS, we have two-dimensional velocities. Remember, on the right, Fluent's 3D. So what you can get out of a 3D model, you can ask for the depth averaged velocities. So what's being plotted on the right is actually the depth averaged velocities for every cell, not looking straight down on it. OK. And so you can see. Fluent through some of these gate openings, the very first gate opening, very low velocity, same with RAS. And that's because of this concrete right here causes the flow to contract, and it can't bend fast enough to get through that first gate opening. And both models predicted that. The second gate opening, a little bit higher velocity, same with RAS. And then the third gate opening, higher, and the three, four, five through like nine and nine or so high velocities. And then the last gate is opening slower velocity. So again, not exactly the same answers, but similar trends between the 2D model and the 3D model. So this made us feel quite a bit better about yet yeah, RAS being used as a screening tool to narrow down what the gate openings should be, how many, how deep, et cetera, for various flow rates and runs that they did. But then when they narrow it down to a couple of the possible designs, they did the final run in Fluent 3D. This dramatically cut down the number of runs that they had to do with the 3D model. And remember, with the 3D model, you've got to build a, that three-dimensional terrain for all these runs, OK, and then run it in 3D, which takes a lot longer, OK, tremendously longer. 
So they were able to save a lot of time in using RAS as a preliminary screening tool to get a rough idea of the gate openings, the number, the depth, the width, and the configuration for different flow rates and lake levels, and then use Fluent to get the final design. Here's a plot of velocities through the gate openings. And on top is the RAS. Now remember, these are two-dimensional velocities. And at the bottom, it's the three-dimensional velocity. So you kind of got to think outside the box a little bit and say, well, these are RAS's velocities are depth average, of course, because it's just two-dimensional flow. And Fluent is three-dimensional velocities. But you can see on the right, they both predicted low velocity and then getting higher velocity and then much higher velocity. And then over on the right, starting to get lower velocity again. So again, not exactly the same, but similar. But one thing we were able to check is that how much flow and the average velocity of the entire flow going through the gate. So for each gate opening, Fluent and RAS both showed a, a flow rate. And from that flow rate and water service, we were able to compute the average velocity. The gates on the far right, the larger gates, didn't have that much flow, even though they're larger and the velocities were slower. Uh, they both predicted around 980 CFS, and Fluent had an uh, average velocity of 6.78 and RAD 6.1, okay, because they had different water surfaces a little slightly, okay. And, and then they had about 1,400 and some CFS, similar velocities, 1,100 and some CFS, similar velocities, et cetera. So not exactly the same, but very similar um, water surfaces, flow rates, and velocities, okay. Um, but again, the 3D model is is, prob is without a doubt the better answer, and, and but RAS is doing quite well compared to it in this case. And then let's look at an animation of that, okay? And here we'll look at it in terms of velocity form, and this is just straight out of RAS Mapper. So in this case, the pump station is turned completely off, no water going through the pumps. It's only going through the gate openings. So you can see this water is converging around here, and it can't turn fast enough to fill this gate opening with a lot of flow. And there's an eddy that even forms out here. So we got this flow turning, okay? Normal occurrence, this is a high flow. In this case, there's no hurricane, but there's a lot of water raining in the city and being pumped into the canal and sending it towards Lake Pontchartrain. You get these eddies forming in here. Okay. So pretty cool stuff. So let's summarize. So to do detailed modeling like some of these examples that we've just shown you requires the following. First of all, you got to select the correct equations for the problem. And for all these problems, the St. Bernard equations were, in this case, the correct equations. The diffusion wave without the acceleration terms really was not going to be able to do any of those problems accurately. You get an answer, but it wasn't, wouldn't be the right answer Okay, in many in many instances there. Um, but we also need the right computational mesh. So as you can see, if we're looking to get detailed velocities around objects like piers and abutments or through gate openings or around a bend, we need small cells, okay, uh, in order to get that detailed velocity distribution, especially around something as small as a pier that might only be a four foot wide pier, okay. So you're going to need to use smaller cells. You probably going to need break lines and refinement regions. Uh, the whole model doesn't have to have the small cells, but where the where you want the detailed velocity does, and then away from that, you can gradually transition to larger cells. Then, given those small cells and the high velocities, you've got to pick the right time step. And whenever you're doing detailed modeling, you really should start with strict current condition numbers. Like if I'm using the full shallow water equations, I'm going to use that equation assuming a current number of one. And for a given velocity I'm going to, and cell size, I'm going to back out an appropriate time step. And a current condition of one just means if I have a cell size that's two feet and water's traveling 10 feet per second, okay, it only takes two tenths of a second to get through that cell. So I want to use 0.2 second time steps or smaller. That's what that current condition basically means. Uh, most of these problems, you should, if there's going to be flow separations and eddies forming, you should turn on turbulence modeling, which brings in a problem, though. What do you use for the eddy viscosity coefficients? Well, the problem with that is we don't know. We have some rough guidelines, but those are parameters that really should be calibrated. So just like in 1D, when you have contraction expansion coefficients, we have some rough guidelines. But if you have really sharp contractions and expansions, that's something that in order to know if you have the right coefficients, you really need some calibration data. 
Okay, so that can be problematic in this type of modeling. What eddy viscosity coefficients do I need to use? And if I don't really know, sometimes I, I know if, if, if I don't really know the right coefficients, I'll still turn it on, but I'll start with low coefficients and get the model running. And then I might test the sensitivity of the coefficients with higher value to see what it does to the answer. Okay. And then this theta parameter. Um, and generally for a lot of these runs, you saw, not all of them though, I was reducing theta towards 0.6, especially the tidal one. You can't do tidal propagation without you're going to diffuse the wave propagation if you leave theta at one for tidal. So if always for tidal situations, you should drop that theta towards 0.6 uh, at a minimum 0.8 to get more accurate answers at predicting the tide propagating in and out. The full shallow water equations should absolutely be used for really rapidly rising and falling floodways like dam breaks, okay, or gates being opened really quickly and closed really quickly. If you need detailed water services and velocities around an object, got to use the full sample knot. If you have mixed flow where you're going from supercritical, through critical depth to supercritical and a hydraulic jump, that absolutely has to be mixed uh, full shallow water equations. Diffusion wave can't even do that at all. Tidal, got to use full shallow water. Super elevation or around a bend, need those acceleration terms. And anywhere where you have abrupt contractions and expansions, if you don't have those acceleration terms in there, you're not going to predict the right water service upstream. You're going to have too low of a water service because the acceleration terms aren't accounting for the force of the flow contracting, which is a force pushing the water upstream to slow it down. Okay, it's just not going to have that in there. 